so now I'll introduce our next speaker, um, Camila Rosa Concilio. Um, Camila trained uh, in biomedicine and genetics before pursuing her PhD in immunology, um, where she studied how sex hormone signaling impacted immune responses in cancer and infection. And last year, she started her postdoctoral studies in Petter Broden's lab at the Karolinska, um, where she's been applying systems level computational approaches to understand human immune function. And the title of her talk today is Deciphering the Role of Sex Hormones in Human Antiviral Immunity. Go ahead. So thank you for that kind of introduction, Stacy, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm really excited to share with you the work I've been doing for my postdoc. And so I'm going to start with a question that our lab is interested in which is what under, underlies the vast variability in human immune responses. And so this is a question that has become more and more important, especially in the past year, where we can see that there's great variability in immune responses to viral infections such as SARS-CoV-2. So for example, we have some people that have very mild symptoms. Other people will end up uh, requiring hospitalization and intensive care. There's also the deal of um, some people requiring um, having a long uh, or quick immune responses towards the virus, whereas other people might actually clear it quickly, but then develop an inflammatory pathology that lasts um, for months maybe, as in the case of um, long COVID. And so I'm interested in understanding what factors could be underlying this variability in humans. And so before we go into that, there are critical components of an antiviral immune response that need to happen in order to contain a viral insult. And these require a timely and robust immune response. So there's gonna be coordination of innate and local immune responses that happen at the site of the viral infection. It's really important that as the previous speaker just said, there's type one and type three interferon production that's really important for this antiviral state. There's gonna be recruitment of uh, innate lymphocytes such as NK cells and a coordination uh, with the adaptive immune system where T cells and B cells will be generated. They will um, eventually lead to specificity and memory responses towards uh, the virus. And so it's really important that this happens in a timely manner and that the inflammatory process that happens is regulated. So the inflammation happens in the tissue is regulated to that area and in a timely manner so you don't have tissue damage. And so when we think of these key aspects of an antiviral immune response, it's been shown that variability in each one of these steps can impact uh, susceptibility to a viral infection and severity from viral infection, as we know as the, for example, the case of type one interferon. And so what factors could cause this variability? And so today I really want to focus on biological sex and its importance in underlying vir variability in immune responses. And it's widely known that uh, there are sex differences in disease. And so when we look at females, for example, there's a higher prevalence of autoimmunity in females, whereas in males, there's higher rates of cancer and an infection, men tend to have more severe infection than women. Again, when we come back to SARS-CoV-2 infection, the current pandemic, men have been um, had more hospitalizations and higher deaths than females. Um, and so this points to how sex differences play a role in immune responses. And there's a vast um, work in the literature that has been identifying pathways and why these um, sex differences arise. And so it's been pointed out through some of these studies that innate and adaptive immune responses are, tend to be more robust in females when compared to males. And this is also true for a response to vaccines, which is heightened in females. And so we know that these sex differences exist, but it's really important to try to understand what underlie these differences. And so there are societal factors that can play a role. There are genetic factors, for example, in humans, females uh, have XX chromosomes, uh, males have XY, and there are many immune genes that are expressed in the X chromosomes, such as CLR7, that play a role in this generation of antiviral immune responses. So the regulation in the genetic level is important. And sex hormones are also going to be playing a role as males and females have different levels of sex hormones that vary throughout their time, um, throughout their age. And so the question really becomes, how can we distinguish sex hormones and genetic effects on immunity, and especially in humans? And so this is the question that we're trying to address uh, in this study. 
And so we have a cohort of subjects that are undergoing sex reassignment therapy with uh, hormone treatment. And so as you can understand, these subjects have a fixed genetic background and they're gonna receive hormone treatment to either undergo a male to female transition utilizing GnRH agonist and estradiol treatment or they're gonna undergo a female to male hormone transition with testosterone. And so we follow these subjects over time and we have samples at baseline after three months and after 12 months of treatment. And we can then interrogate how their immune systems are changing as a matter of the sex hormones. And so today I'm really gonna be focusing on the subjects that are undergoing this female to male transition with testosterone treatment. And what I want you to see here is that before they initiate treatment, so their baseline values of bioavailable testosterone are low. And as they initiate treatment, as they receive testosterone, their bioavailable testosterone levels really go up to within a male range. Whereas when we look at the estradiol levels in these subjects over time, it really remains, um, it doesn't change very much. And so, this allows us to ask the question, how does testosterone modulate the immune system in humans? And so we ask this using system levels approaches that include um, looking into immune cell phenotype and composition. And we do this by using mass cytometry. We can also look into um, immune function through uh, immune cell transcriptomics. We do that by RNA sequencing. And we also look at the plasma proteome using O-link technologies. And so to start, our first question was, is there compositional changes that are happening in immune populations in these subjects as they, as they receive testosterone? And so we used a panel that could identify 65 different blood immune cell populations. And we can look at these subjects over time um, in this 2D plot, in this MDS plot. And so what you're seeing here is pretty much the immune composition of these subjects that is changing over time. So you have baseline, visit two and visit three after testosterone treatment. And we can first of all observe that there's a great inter-individual variability, which is expected, uh, especially in humans. But what's really interesting here is that there's this shared change over time over the course of hormone treatment that these subjects are experiencing that kind of goes from left to right and downwards. And so the question now becomes, what could be the cell types that are changing over the testosterone treatment? And so, the 65 different populations that we're assessing, we looked at them in terms of how they correlated with bioavailable testosterone levels. And we observed four major populations that were changing with bioavailable testosterone levels. And so as bioavailable testosterone levels increased, and so they're undergoing treatment, uh, NK cell counts and CD11 CDC counts were increasing, whereas PDCs and mate cells were decreasing their counts over time. And here I want to emphasize the role of PDCs who are important uh, type one interferon producers are really important early on in an, uh, in an antiviral uh, immune response. And the fact that they're going down could really mean that maybe these subjects would have less to start with uh, in terms of an antiviral immune response. And so we were interesting as, interested as well to understand how their phenotypic changes could uh, be happening over the course, course of testosterone treatment. And so the first thing that we noticed is that within the PDC population, we could observe that the median expression of CD33, which is a myeloid marker, was going up, whereas HLA-DR and HC class 2 molecule was going down. And so we then wanted to look, phenotypically speaking, how these PDCs were looking in terms of uh, subpopulations. And so what you're seeing here is a phenotype graph pretty much of these PDCs over, of course, a visit one baseline and two and three after testosterone treatment. And we can see that there's this shift from a population that's more or highly expressing CD45RA, CD85J, and HLA-DR towards the population that express lower levels of these markers. Further, we also identify that there are two subcell populations of PDCs, which here I'm calling PDC6 and PDC7, that are going up with a visit, so up with testosterone treatment. Um, this is also uh, shown here as cluster six and seven, you can see they're going up. And one of these populations is a, a PDC population that expresses CD81 and CD5 and has been previously described to uh, fail to produce type 1 interferon, whereas it could actually better activate BNT lymphocytes. 
Another subpopulation that we're seeing increase here are the CD45 RE positive, CD33 positive pre-DCs. And so what we're really seeing here is that PDC levels are going down, but also their phenotypic changes are, change, um, are changing over the course of testosterone treatment. Another question we had was whether cell-cell relationships were changing over the course of uh, testosterone treatment. And I want to show you here, this is, these are um, correlation maps that you're seeing all these different cell populations that we're looking into before the start of treatment, after three months and 12 months of testosterone treatment. And what we can really see here is that there are some populations that are highly correlated in the beginning before testosterone treatment that where this uh, correlation is lost over time. Such populations uh, include CD11 CDCs being correlated with uh, T uh, central memory CD8s and KTs and neutrophils. And it's been shown that the crosstalk of some of these cells is important to dampen inflammation. So the fact that they're not as highly correlated could implicate in the extent of where uh, inflammation happens in these subjects upon an encounter. Another cell population uh, or cell-cell relationship that has been changing and so before the start of the treatment, they weren't correlated and now they become correlated are uh, Tregs, non-classical monocytes, eosinophils and PDCs. And so again, coming back to this um, correlation and crosstalk between PDCs and Tregs, where it's actually could be helping a suppressive function to inhibit autoimmunity, again, to maybe contain inflammatory insults. And so the fact that these cell-cell relationships are changing over time could be an indication that an inflammatory process or a viral encounter would be different. And thirdly, we also observe that the neutrophil to CD4 T cell ratio is increasing over the course of treatment as these people uh, receive testosterone treatment. And the ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes, and specifically here we're focusing on CD4 T cells, has been associated with severity of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and, um, and uh, negative conversion time. And so just to summarize this first part of the talk, I'm showing here that we see cell compositional changes that in cell-cell uh, relationships and cell phenotypes that are changing with bioavailable testosterone levels. So how as uh, testosterone levels go up? And so now we wanted to really look into functionally speaking, what could be happening, happening with the immune system due to testosterone. So we evaluate changes in gene expression of about 25,000 genes. Um, and we correlate these to uh, testosterone levels, taking into account the age, the BMI, and the cell composition of these, um, of these subjects. And so we can see here there are genes that are going up with bivalent testosterone and going down with it, but we wanted to make sense of it, it as a functional um, biological gene set. And so we ran gene set enrichment analysis and we, what we observe here is there are many different gene sets that were enriched with bioavailable testosterone. And I wanna highlight two of these, Ant innate antiviral response and T cell activation. And so when we look at the innate antiviral immune response genes that are enriched with testosterone levels, we can see mainly uh, the main ones shown here are interferon um, response genes. But some of these, for example, RxRA is a negative regulator of uh, type one response, uh, ty type one interferon response. And ERF7 coming back to PDCs is an important uh, transcription factor for their function, for antiviral function. And so that's going down. Finally, when we look at T cell activation, what we think we're seeing here is actually a modulation away from Th1 polarization. So if you look at the genes that are going up and going down with bioavailable testosterone, I want to highlight TIGIT, which induces a more suppressive responses in T cells. Icarus, for example, is a negative regulator of type one responses. And we also see two important players in type one and uh, type three responses, IL-12 receptor beta one and IL-21 receptor going down with testosterone levels. And so again, we're coming back to this chain, these changes that are happening in terms of cell composition relationships and now functionally speaking in RNA expression that is being modulated by testosterone. And so finally, the last assay, the last piece of data that I wanted to show you today is on um, plasma proteomics um, that is changing with bioavailable testosterone levels. So we assessed um, plasma proteins that are changing 
in terms of immune responses and inflammation. This is a panel that encompasses about 180 proteins. And what we're seeing here, again, is that we do have um, plasma proteins going up with testosterone, some are going down. And so I want to highlight two of these TNF um, members, uh, family members that are going up, so which are rank ligand and trail. And for example, IL-18, once again, type 1 immunity being decreased uh, with testosterone levels. And so to summarize my talk today, we're able to see in humans how testosterone can modulate important players in human antiviral immunity by assessing cell composition, immune cell transcriptomics, and plasma protein profiling. And we're really seeing that this, these important players in antiviral immunity are, be, are changing with testosterone. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the work that we've done. This is a really nice collaborative effort between the Broden Lab, the Shump Lab, and the Landegren Lab in many clinics in Stockholm. And special thanks to our lab members at Petters Lab. Um, everyone just works together really well, and this is a really a collaborative, uh, big team effort. And with that, I'd like to take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much, Camila. That was a great talk. Um, so I'll start with one question um, from the attendees. What are the immunological implications of neutrophil to absolute CD4 T cell ratios on susceptibility to disease following testosterone therapy? Or do you have any ideas of what that might be? Right, so usually when we tend to think of this ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes, it's more of a like background inflammatory um, response. And so in general, when people are looking, and this has been correlated with COVID, when people look at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, and that being higher in severe cases, for example, uh, it's really talking about this underlying inflammation that's going on. And so in terms of CD4s, usually when you do this kind of comparison, you're looking into CD4, CD8s, and, and Ks, and so on. Uh, the CD4s has been, have been correlated with the um, underlying uh, just with the timing of the disease. And so it's, it's more of a matter, I think, with the severe inflammatory response, I guess, is the short question, is the short answer. Okay. Um, and I guess we have time for one more. Um, I, 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 could, I could ask oh, you. Go ahead, Alex. <laughs> uh, great, this is a great talk. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could speculate at all or tell us how you think about what, what are the direct effects of testosterone? Which cell types are the primary responders and which are the direct target genes that are driving these, these cascades? Yeah. That's a really good question. I think that's uh, a really important question to ask here is how, if we're seeing these immune changes, what is being modulated? And so when you talk about testosterone and sex hormone modulation of the immune system, it's known that many uh, sex hormone receptors are expressed in immune cells. So for example, I've shown a lot of uh, this data is showing that PDCs are changing and their phenotype and their levels and so on. In, in human blood, it's been shown that PDCs have high levels of androgen receptor, at least comparatively to the other immune cells. So it could be that testosterone is actually acting directly in the PDCs, but it could also be, you know, in terms of development that could be happening, it could be recruitment, it could be going somewhere else as well. So these are really good and relevant questions. Okay, I think we're about out of time, but there are a couple other questions in the Q&A if you wanna answer those um, when you have time. Uh, and thank now we're going to be taking, yeah, thank you very much.